This is a reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Well, I want to add my welcome to you, Grace Church, and uh, anyone who might be visiting with us uh, on the web today. We're glad that you have joined us for our worship service, and we'll continue our worship as we hear the Word of God um, proclaim to us truth, and, uh, and it's our desire that that truth changes us. My, my name is Tim Cowan. I'm one of the uh, pastors here at Grace Church, and uh, looking forward to sharing with you what God has put on my heart uh, this day. If ever there was someone who I could identify with this morning, I think I would choose the name uh, Joseph. His story's been resonating with me for quite some time now, and I think it's because of the questions that I'm about to ask. Have you ever felt like everything was falling apart? Have you ever found yourself wondering, what else could go wrong now? Have you thought to yourself that you are struggling to sense God's loving kindness to you? Sometimes life feels like you can take no more. And I think I'm at that place, or I've been at that place in the, in the past two months or so, and I can relate to it. Do you? It wasn't too long ago that uh, this particularly came to mind. I collapsed in my bed one evening and started what I'll call a full-on pity party. I found myself enumerating aloud to my wife about all that had transpired over the course of this past year, these 12 months, and I blurted them all out to, their, out to her as they came to mind. I started with the kidney stones, no ordinary ones at that, which required two procedures, and that was followed by a stent, all of which took five months to resolve. And then came the bone marrow biopsy, which led to the diagnosis of multiple myeloma, followed by a year-long therapy of chemo and immunotherapy drugs that's coming to an end in about another month or so, and all the side effects that go along with that. I wasn't done. My rant continued. There was a trip to the dentist for a broken tooth and then a crown that followed that. Never had a crown before. And let's not forget that it was time again for my delightful five-year colonoscopy. I noted, too, that in the past 12 months, I've been blasted with far more radiation from x-rays than I had the previous 59 years of life. I'm quite certain I glow in the dark now. December greeted me with the news that our health insurance would increase yet again, double of what we paid the previous year. So there were some financial concerns that came to me. And here we are stuck in a house for who knows how long, 
surrounded by a virus that no one really understands very much about, we have no clue when it'll end. Life as I knew it had drastically changed. Give me a break. I'm tired. Now, do you feel sorry for me yet? Well, you don't need to. Because I did plenty for both of us that night as Karen patiently listened to my pathetic whining and complaints. Yes. The story of Joseph resonates with me these days. And this morning I want to unpack to you why this is so. I'll quickly run through his story, only touching on certain passages, uh, beginning around Genesis 37, continuing through chapter 50, which was the passage that Walt read for us at the beginning, all of which God has used to reshape my focus. And my hope is that he will reshape your focus as well uh, through what God has put on my heart. I just want to be true to his word. And so let's, let's call upon him now as we begin and ask him to do just that. And so Heavenly Father, uh, as we come to you today, we recognize that without you and your spirit who dwells within us, those of us who believe, have your life breathed into us and have your spirit on board to teach us, and so we ask you, Holy Spirit, will you open our eyes and our ears that we may be able to receive from you what you have for us. Humble us, Father, that we might be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Joseph was just 17 years old at the time that he finds himself in the crosshairs of his jealous brothers who envied that he was the apple of his father's eye. He was the 11th of 12 sons, but he was very, very special to Jacob because he was a son of his old age, the passage says. And Joseph, or Jacob rather, gave Joseph this spectacular coat to wear, not choosing to try to hide his favoritism from the other brothers. Now, Joseph had his faults as well. Uh, he was a bit of a tattler on his older brothers by bringing bad reports to his father about them. <laughs> that they disliked him would be to put it very mildly. And then when he told his brothers about a dream that he had in which they bowed down to him, they were pushed over the edge. And they despised him even more. Soon after, the brothers, in their hatred, intended to kill him. And through a series of events, they instead sold him to some Midianites, Midianite traders, in fact, who were passing by and headed towards Egypt. And so they took him to Egypt, and then they sold him again to Potiphar, who was the captain of the guard and an officer of Pharaoh. Now, as a servant in Potiphar's household, Joseph then finds himself the apple of another eye. This time, he caught the attention and the lustful desires of Potiphar's wife. But Joseph refused to go down that trail with her and rebuffed her inappropriate advances towards him, which led to a true demonstration of the age-old saying, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Scorn that led to this outrageous lie that he concocted or she concocted and propagated about Joseph, turning the story around, in fact, to make it appear as though he was the pursuer guilty of trying to rape her. Next thing you know, now falsely accused, Joseph is suddenly thrown into prison. No, things didn't seem to be getting any better for him. Genesis 40 details what happened next. He was in prison. And there he meets two officers of the Pharaoh of Egypt. They were prisoners, in fact, the king's cupbearer and baker. And they were jailed for having committed an offense against the Pharaoh. And then one night, these two men each had a dream. And each dream was different, had its own interpretation. However, neither one of them could interpret their own dream. 
And they were troubled to the point that when Joseph saw them, he saw they were distraught. And so Joseph offers to interpret their dreams for them. So the cupbearer told his dream to him and was quite pleased with the analysis that uh, Joseph gave him. For Joseph's interpretation spoke of the cupbearer soon released from prison and his restoration to his former position as cupbearer to the king. Now all Joseph asked in exchange for that interpretation was this, only remember me when it is well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh so as to get me out of this house. And a baker saw that favorable interpretation and quickly shared his dream with Joseph too. However, his dream pointed to a deadly end whereby Joseph predicted that the baker would be hanged by the Pharaoh in just three days. Now that's what you call a classic buzzkill. The baker must have thought to himself, no croissants for you. And so it came to pass that on the third day that the cupbearer was restored to his position as an officer to the king. And the baker was hanged. And yet the cupbearer, who was no doubt elated, with this newfound freedom, promptly forgot Joseph and did not mention him to Pharaoh. But what jogged the cupbearer's memory took place two years later when the Pharaoh had trouble uh, with a dream that he had had. And so he told his dream to the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men in the land, and none were able to interpret it for him. It was then that the cupbearer spoke to Pharaoh and told him of Joseph and how his own dream was interpreted by him. And not only his dream, but also that of the baker and how all that he said would happen actually came to be. Well, Pharaoh quickly called for Joseph and chapter 41 details the story of how he unfolds the dream for the king and how Joseph rises to power and greatness in the land of Egypt. And as a result of all this, Joseph is suddenly second in power to only the Pharaoh himself. And there we will stop for now. When we face the difficulties and troubling circumstances of life, those difficult times which cause us to struggle to see God. There is truth that meets us where we are and offers incredible comfort and hope in chaotic times. Watching Joseph navigate through his difficulties shows us what he knew about God, what he really believed about God would come to the front during his difficulties. And I think it offers for us an example worth following. Where do you see this? Well, the first stop takes us to a short phrase containing only three words, or five words rather, and is found several times in the story. Immediately following Joseph's abduction by his brothers after he was sold to the Midianites in the land of Egypt, and no sooner had he entered the house of Potiphar to what appears to be a life of slavery, fraught with trouble and heartbreak, we are greeted with these words. And the Lord was with Joseph. And when Joseph is falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and is thrown into prison, we read again in chapter 39, verse 21, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. In fact, four times in this passage, we hear these words, the Lord was with Joseph. The presence of God, especially in hard times we face, is a very powerful thing. But know this about it. The presence of God does not necessarily mean that bad things do not happen with those whom the Lord is present. 
but rather the Lord walks closely with his children in the difficulties and struggles that they face. Scripture declares that God says he will never ever leave us or forsake us, regardless of the circumstances that are playing out in our individual lives. Our tendency is to question, why is it that I am facing this tough time? Why me? What is the reason behind this struggle? When we are in pain and in the middle of it all, we can sometimes go so far as to even question the love of God towards us. It's at moments like this that I'm very aware, especially for me, that my focus is inward and it's not on God, it's not upward. Tim Keller reminds us that just because you can't see or imagine a good reason why God would allow something bad to happen, it doesn't mean there can't be one. God is not fickle in anything that he does. In his sovereign wisdom, he accomplishes his purpose for us. Now look, we cannot deny that God certainly could spare us from the uncomfortable suffering that we experience. But he doesn't always do that. He sometimes demonstrates his love for us by sustaining us through the suffering. God does not do this from the grandeur of his lofty heaven. No, he is not far from his children. A farness that we sometimes sense or feel or think is, is going on. But rather, he is closely present with us, even as we suffer. I was thinking about the Apostle Paul. I wondered if he had this in mind when he declares in Romans 8 that the loving God who graciously gave his son for us is demonstrating his love by giving us all things, Paul says. He then comprises a list which illustrates what he means with this incredible rhetorical question that he begins with, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then he enumerates some examples. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine? How about nakedness or danger or sword? No, he says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so you fill in the blank. What is it that you face that can separate you from God's love? Is it the loss of your regular income? Is it the sudden and significant downturn of your stock portfolio? The young people, is it the fact that you are having to do your schoolwork from home and be monitored in some cases by parents, you now wonder how they received their high school diploma or possibly question whether or not they really have one at all? Is the coronavirus really a loving expression of God? When you are having to be holed up in your house, away from the friends that you enjoy to be with, separated from the conveniences we all have come to enjoy and must admit that we love entirely too much. Is God's love seen in the death of a loved one or close friend during a time when you're not allowed to visit them? Do you feel his love when you see the bottom of the freezer or the back of the fridge for the first time in a decade and wonder if you have enough to make it through the current crisis? 
Now Paul clearly states it. That in all these things, whether they are physical in nature, including even in death, he says, or whether they are spiritual in nature, where Satan and his forces uh, oppress us as they exert their power in this world, they tempt us, put things in our minds which are not true. No matter what it is that we are facing presently or what we will ever face in the future, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, Paul says. And so, as these things unfold in our lives, regardless of their difficulty or pain, we can be assured of this, that we are not alone. God is walking with us through the very things that he has actually mapped out for us. Now, how beautiful is that? It has been said that the will of God will never take you where the grace and the providence of God will not protect you. We have a divine traveling companion. And that should bring us tremendous comfort and rest Uh, there's a second truth that we can cling to this morning that should also serve to bring comfort and peace in the chaos of our times. Not only is God's love expressed to us in suffering, but Paul reminded us just a few verses earlier in Romans 8 and verse 28 that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called to his purpose. Now, what does that exactly mean? There is nothing that we have ever faced in the past or are presently facing now or ever will face in the future that hasn't been planned by God for our good and for his glory. Do you believe that? When you stop to think of all that Joseph had to endure, one might think, uh, it reasonable that if anyone deserved to have a Tim meltdown, it would be him. If ever anyone would possess the right to become bitter, Joseph's your guy. But we do not see this in the passage. We come to chapter 50 and verse 19. We see that in the end, the brothers become sorrowful for their evil behavior. And they seek Joseph's forgiveness. And they did so because they were fearful that they would receive severe retribution from Joseph for the way that they had treated him. And now as the right man, uh, the right hand man in power over all the land, they could suffer his wrath. He could do with them whatever he chose to do. But Joseph said to them this, in verse 19 of chapter 50, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? What an interesting statement. In other words, who am I to question God's plan? Do you see that Joseph has complete confidence in the fact that God is sovereign in all things and that God's sovereignty can be trusted? Now look, we would like to say that we share the same confidence in God's sovereignty in all things. If I were to ask for a show of hands of how many cardboard people out here uh, would say that they believe in the fact that God is sovereign in all things, I imagine there would be a bunch of cardboard hands that would go up. I want you to stop and think about what that means. If God is sovereign in all things, it means that there is nothing over which he doesn't have control. Nothing. There are no surprises for him because in his sovereignty he has decreed all things. He completely reigns over everything. 
Even sinful and evil decisions people make do not escape his sovereign plan. Though he does not take responsibility for their sinful choices. God cannot practice evil or be blamed for sin. But at the same time, evil and sin are still part of his sovereign decree. Or he is not sovereign in all things. I think that when Joseph asks, am I in the place of God? He is acknowledging the fact that this is true. He is saying God is in control. Now the truth is that we love to be in control ourselves. We often seek our own sovereignty. I've been thinking about this. How does it occur in my own life? Well, proof of this is seen in the way that we say things, the way that we think, and the stuff that we do. Oftentimes, it is revealed in the form of our complaints. Now, think back on how we object to the decisions made by those who are in authority over us. We many times question their decisions and ability to make a wise decision. It doesn't matter if you're talking about uh, those decisions made by those in government around us, those uh, who have been given that kind of authority over us, whether it be our boss or um, someone in charge. Uh, it even finds itself a place in the church where we love to question the decisions that are made. What we really mean is that their decision differs from ours. We get troubled when decisions are made which impact us in ways that upset our routines. And we begin to question their integrity when we are called upon to follow their lead. Especially when it runs headlong into our own preferences. Look, whenever we have to face circumstances that press on our comfort and convenience, complaining is not usually far behind. Now that's been my experience. Is it not true that often our complaints demonstrate how little we understand or appreciate the sovereignty of God in all things? Are we not showing that we have lost sight of the fact that in Proverbs we read these words, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. See, at times like this, do we not actually believe that men and women have the ability through their decisions and conclusions to somehow negate the will of God, the God who we claim to believe that he is sovereign in all things? And so in a moment like this, I rolled out my litany of complaints to Karen. And then in the middle of the night, God, as it were, met me with this thought. Timothy, you think that you were venting to your wife, but in fact, I heard your every word. And more than that, I saw your every thought. And you were questioning me and my sovereign wisdom. So God and I wrestled for a short time, and as usual, God pinned me and prevailed, leading to a confession on my part for the sin of unbelief, the lack of trust in his wise and supreme ways. You know, Tim Keller points out that when pain and suffering come upon us, we finally see not only that we are not in control of our lives, but that we never were. Not only do we not drive the bus, we never had a license to do so. We aren't qualified and never will be because only God is sovereign in all things. His ways, his thoughts, his understanding far exceeds us and always will. He's a sovereign God. 
And so when we truly embrace his sovereignty in all things, we let go of our questions concerning why things are happening the way they are. And we take a new perspective and turn a different direction. We turn to him in faith, believing that God is working out all things, even pain and suffering, to shape us into the people he desires us to be. COVID-19. It's one of those things that has offered to most of us a tough time. But it is not something for which we should spend our time looking for someone to blame unless you are prepared to blame God and question his wisdom. And I don't think we want to go there. You see, Joseph understood that he was not in the place of God. And in the face of the greatest intentions of evil aimed at him, he trusted God, believing that God was at work accomplishing the greatest good. And he says it this way to his brothers, especially at the end of chapter 50, around verse 20, he says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. He understood that in his sovereignty, God was working out salvation for his people. And he left it at that. The sovereign plan of God in all things is the truth of Scripture. And the greatest example of this played out in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now think about the amazing parallels of Joseph and Jesus. Jesus was favored of his father and became a slave that he might seek and save those who hated him and even sought to kill him. He suffered false accusations and he was arrested, unjustly tried and convicted and ultimately killed at the hands of evil men. And yet, he was sinless and innocent of any wrongdoing. But even this was part of God's good and sovereign plan. Have you ever thought about it that way? Yes, the greatest of all evil ever committed was exactly what God had planned in order to accomplish the greatest good of all time. The salvation of a people for his great glory. That's us who believe. We are a product of that. Our salvation was accomplished in the face of evil and suffering, of difficulty, to bring about the forgiveness of our sin and a right standing with God for all who will surrender their lives to him and follow Jesus. If you are a follower of Jesus, you can now rest assured and have the confident hope that God is with you and that he is accomplishing his wise purposes for your good and for his glory. The tough times that we find ourselves in these days are not the work of clever folks. They are not controlled by oppressive governments or radical leaders. Nor are they things that have occurred by accident or chance. I agree with Francis Havergal, who wrote uh, the third verse of this song. And here are the words, Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love. We may trust him fully, all for us to do. And they who trust him wholly find him wholly true. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. We can be confident. We have hope. We can trust him. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus today, and I imagine there are some here who uh, are, are listening 
and, and, and recognize that they don't have that confidence or that hope. Might today be the day for you to put your trust in Him? To surrender to Him that you too might share in the confidence and hope of which we are speaking. I encourage you, if God is, is reaching down to you right now and you sense that he is, He's encouraging you to, to, to give up, to surrender to Him, will you do that? I'd love if you'd reach out to me. You can find uh, my uh, email address right there on the website. And, and uh, I would love to be able to spend some time talking with you, perhaps even on the phone, that you may meet this one who gives us hope, takes away our fear, who travels with us, who's present with us. You don't have to go it alone. You don't have to be in charge. You don't have to try to figure it out. He's already done that. Will you trust him? I often think about the things that I've struggled through, as I told you, and I wonder, you know, what is it that God is up to? What is he doing? One of the things that often makes me most perspire and worry is when I, I run into something financial that's bigger than me. When we got word that uh, the health insurance was going to double, you know, panic struck me to the place where I remember I was sweating. It was a Wednesday evening. And uh, I was going to go to divorce care. Uh, it's a it's a group that that meets and I was going to be part of that group and, and and share with the folks there the videos and be able to chat with them and talk with them and I went over early hoping just to to sit quietly by myself and there was a person sitting there in the chair really early and I walked up to her and called her by name and asked her are you okay and she said well not really because today I just found out that my health insurance was going to double I said, well, now, I, I can relate to that. And she said, well, I have no way of figuring out how I'm going to pay for it. And I'm scared. We shared with one another for a while. I recognized as we talk <clears throat> that she was not the only one who was afraid. So was I. And I found myself thinking more about myself than, than her need at the time, too, the more we talked. turned on the video and I sat in the back of the room and there were probably 15 people present and as it played I began to sweat I found it hard to breathe doubted was terrified it got so bad I had to stand up I had to walk out of the room and go into another room that was vacant and open the window and try to breathe some air and here I am I'm asking myself here you are a pastor who's struggling to believe what you say you believe. But it's where I was. So I came back to the room after a while, and we finished up that night, and I was walking home, and I was on the sidewalk between the church and my house. And I stopped. And I looked up into the starlit sky and I said to God with these words verbally, God, what am I going to do? How are you going to get me through? He didn't use verbal words back to me, but it's as though he did. Because this is what flooded into my mind. Tim, when was the last time I let you down? And I said, you've never have. And it was lifted. Weight came off. And I walked into the house and shared with Karen all that had transpired. 
That was a Wednesday. The next day, we went to visit our son for dinner and his family. And we were meeting with them. And and Dan asked me, he said, you know, how are things going, Dad? Is, is everything OK? And I said, well, it's good as can be expected, I guess. And, you know, things are going to be a little financially tough next year. And he said, Dad, you don't have to be afraid. And I thought what he was going to say is, you know, I'll take care of you, which he's told me before. You know, that's backwards in my head about how things should be, right? You're taking care of your kids, not having them take care of you at this point. But I thought he was going to say that, but he didn't. He said this to me. Dad, when was the last time God ever let you down? I said, he never has. And he never will. Went home, actually feeling pretty good, relieved. And when I got there, on the table, there sat an envelope. An envelope that I never expected to see. Didn't know what it was said something about healthcare markets on it. And I said, oh, here's, uh, here's some news here from the healthcare markets telling us we better make sure we sign up for whatever policy for next year. And here's the bad news about how it's going to double. But when I opened it, it was a check that more than covered all of the need. It was a check of excess one I never expected to see. You know, the reason that that check came was not only that God was taking care of us, but it was because of my cancer diagnosis that it came. It came through a supplemental insurance policy. And it was at that moment that I realized that this cancer has very little to do with me. This cancer has to do with God and what he is doing in this world to accomplish his purposes in us. That's the kind of God that we can put our trust in and have confidence in. He wants us, in fact, I believe that without my cancer, suppose that he healed us, or healed me completely, which he could do, and he still might. But as long as I have cancer, I am learning that I must depend upon him. And so it wouldn't surprise me if he left me with cancer so that I would not forget. These are the thoughts that have been running around my mind concerning Joseph and it's reshaped my thinking. And I trust that it's reshaped yours as well. So these things I commit to you in the name of the Sovereign Father and his gracious Son, our Lord Jesus Christ and the great comforter, the Holy Spirit. Amen.